So for this final hour, I'm just going to invite our panelists. So we have Michelle, please. And basically, we'll just sit there, and maybe we can make a, like a half moon shape. What, am I doing something wrong? Oh, oh yes, people need to have microphones so that because we're videotaping all this. And uh, I think he will help you all with that. So, so we, have, we have Michelle, we have Michaela, Janan, Chris, Bob Scharf, and Adina. And Adina is the only person I haven't introduced yet, so all you guys are all getting settled. I'm going to introduce Adina here, please. So Adina is the Hellman Family Distinguished Professor at Dartmouth. She's a professor of philosophy, and she's the chair of the Cognitive Science Program at Dartmouth College. She received a PhD from the University of California, San Diego in neuroscience and cognitive science in 95, and another PhD from MIT in philosophy in 2004, and a law degree from Yale <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, uh, in 2014. Her philosophical research interests lie at the intersection of philosophy and neuroscience and include philosophy of mind, philosophy of science, and ethics. Mm -hmm. She has received many awards, including the William James Prize and the Stanton Prize, awarded by the Society of Philosophy and Psychology, a Mellon News Direction Fellowship, there are others. And um, she's also the co-author of a book with Stephen Morse called A Primer on Criminal Law and Neuroscience. So are we? She's coming. so I can see you all. Perfect. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. No, that's fine. So, um, so the idea here is um, to just have a very informal conversation about what we have learned, what we have not learned, if we have questions to one another. And, um, and you know, basically, the, the way it goes is uh, I'll give everyone five minutes or more, if necessary, to make a point of view. Or if you don't have anything to say, it's fine, too. Um, it's not a problem. I just wanted to ask, first of all, Adina, since she has She's the only one that hasn't spoken. If you, if you did have some points you wanted to make just to start things up. Yeah, I guess um, I at least have some, some thoughts about the things that I've heard. So uh, one thing that strikes me is that uh, perspectivalism about science is uh, the right way to go. Um, it seems to capture, uh, <laughs> can you hear me? Uh, it seems to capture the social reality of science. It, um, it, it captures the fact that models are kinds of idealizations that we make uh, and theories that we offer are conveyed in terms of the concepts that we already possess or de develop in the course of science. Um, and the, the things that our science represents are not things in themselves, uh, but representations for that things, for those things and, and designed for human consumption. So a science that doesn't deliver things that mesh in the right kind of way with the conceptual structure of human beings at the time is not a science that's recognized as being, uh, as, as doing the right kind of thing. Um, so it's, I think, realist in acknowledging that there's an intersubjective world um, that our science may more or less adequately capture. Uh, and I like the idea that, that uh, Mark gave of how these different kinds of models can coexist or cohere in a loose kind of way, but uh, I think there's much more that needs to be said about what that kind of coherence looks like. Um, so one kind of coherence is standard reductionism, and, and I think that that's not necessarily uh, the measure of adequate coherence. Um, in fact, I think you know, it, f it fails in various places for various reasons. Carl Craver has recently put forward a model of uh, sort of a mosaic uh, of different kinds of theories and levels of theories uh, that may be a more representative 
idea of what that kind of coherence requires, but it seems like there, there has to be some kind of coherence uh, because at least we postulate that that world that we're trying to get at is a coherent thing in, in some way or, or other. Um, so I think that maybe trying to figure out what kinds of constraints uh, a perspectival science needs to uh, embody would, would be helpful. Um, so science gives us some picture of the world and I think one type of thing in the world that there is are uh, other minds and those other minds are essential in constructing the world that scientists live in and the world that people live in. Um, as well as the instruments by which we try to perceive and understand the world. And um, we can view those things also as objects of science. Um, and I think what they help us do is extend uh, our experience far beyond what Mother Nature originally gave us. Um, we can think of that as allowing us to apply different kinds of conceptual filters. I liked Peter's way of talking about uh, filters at different levels of abstraction of the world, and that's one way in which you can see this perspectivalist um, picture of science take hold. Um, there were a few things that were said that I think, uh, well, at least I take issue with them. I'm not sure whether, um, whether I would go so far to say is that they're unhelpful, but I think that the sort of damning attitude to reductionism um, might be driven by this view that all reductionism requires elimination, and I don't think that that's necessary. In fact, uh, reduction between levels of, or, or between models in our patchwork of, of science doesn't mean that we need to throw out a model at a higher level. And similarly, I think that a lot of the um, worries people have about the exclusion argument are driven by a mistaken picture of what reduction actually entails. Um, so it's important to think that, to, or to realize that the exclusion argument is really an argument about explanations, and explanations are things that we do, um, and their interest and system relative, as uh, Mark said, and, and because they're interest and system relative, there's no reason that one explanation needs to drive out another explanation. So I think a lot of the worries that are um, spurred by the exclusion problem are, are mistaken. And uh, I pe think Peter gave one kind of answer to the exclusion problem. Steve Yablo has given a more, you know, so a, an answer couched more in philosophical terms, but, but very much with the same uh, kind of take home, which is that uh, there are certain things that are best explained at certain levels, and it really depends on what you're trying to get at. Um, I guess the last thing I want to say is that I, I was particularly taken by uh, Janan's picture of the circle and closing the circle as a way of bringing together the subject and object um, and doing that by talking about fixed points where I take it that her fixed point is uh, the experience itself or the experiencing subject. Um, so I am here now at a series of time points. and. Um, I guess I have some questions. I wonder whether that picture is enough to alleviate worries, for instance, about the nature of a qualitative state, how easily those fit into the picture. Um, but I think more fundamentally, it seems like a fixed point, as you said, it is connected to a stream of subjective um, states or you know, a, sub a stream of here I am now, here I am now. Um, and I wonder whether you're helping yourself to something by talking about a stream um, or connection because it seems like in a way the question is, well, what makes it that one here I am now is connected to the next here I am now uh, and not some other one? And so um, I, I just love to hear your thoughts about that. Um, other And one other thought I had is, uh, you know, you, the way you drove, I love the, the little video of the, the line, line in space time, um, but that subject at the center has access only to the things in its light cone. And I take it that what uh, science is trying to do, or that maybe the picture of the absolute that, uh, that I guess Adam was trying to, to argue against, or, or at least 
I, I, you found it compelling, but ultimately uh, maybe unreachable. And it seems to me that what science is trying to do is allow us through reason and inference to make knowledge claims about stuff beyond the light, our light tone. Um, and uh, to give us some kind of epistemic access to the kind of thing that is beyond our subjectivity. Um, and that I guess nothing that I heard to at this meeting made me think that that's in principle impossible. Um, and so in some sense, the, you know, that kind of absolutist goal of science, I think is at least achievable. Um, but nothing I heard <coughs> made me uh, think that we're any closer to getting rid of the paradoxes that uh, Michelle talked about at the end. So um, I guess that's, those are my thoughts and I'd love to hear what you have to Thank say you. to them. No, that was excellent. Janan, you want to say anything about this? Um, gosh, okay, so there's a lot to say. I agree completely that in my 40 minutes, the picture that I drew didn't say anything about what sort of connection there are between um, you know, I help myself to a stream without saying what's the principle of unity for the stream. And there, I mean, that's a great question. There has to be an account of that. And I think the kind of account that I would prefer is a completely deflationary account that says that, you know, elements in this, well, sort of there's the substructure that gives rise to a mental life. And then internally in the stream, relations of kind of mutual accessibility between, um, you know, one thought and the next. So you, the idea is you have an internal kind of epistemic access that the thoughts have to one another that they don't have precisely because any information about other um, minds is filtered through external channels. So that's, you know, the sketch of how that goes. On questions about, um, you know, that, that if you, if science itself depicts the situation of the experiencing subject, as having information at most about things that fall in its past light cone. And yet the scope of our science, you know, um, reaches well beyond that. I think that's absolutely a problem um, for the evidential basis of our theories. We can give a descriptive account of how we go, the sort of inferential steps that lead us from information about local matters of particular fact, collected over the, his collected and accumulated and organized over the history of, um, kind of scientific endeavor into data, um, then yields, you know, sort of theories about dark matter and about um, sort of inflationary models of, cause of, of the universe that put most of the universe itself outside the, not just our light cone, but the light cone of any observer, no matter how long. I think that's an absolutely an epistemic problem for science itself. So um, I think, you know, that's not a problem with my, that's not a problem with the model, it's a problem with the understanding that science itself gives of the position of the observer and the kind of data that we can have. Um, so, so you think that it, it is a mistake for science to make I didn't say that. Or, no, I or didn't. you think it, it's just something that science needs to justify? It's, you know, science is a work in progress right now. And, um, you know, it do, it, as I said, that half the part of closing the circle, one part of closing the circle is the internal, um, you know, the account internal to our models um, that recovers our experience in a way that justifies, that, that, that um, underwrites the use of our experience as evidence for the model. Um, I think everybody agrees right now, especially people in cosmology who are worrying about these evidential problems. Um, you know, not just the mundane problem, you know, about recovering evidence for the model when it goes way beyond anything that, it, that any observer, any collection per observers could possibly have, but also things like Boltzmann brains and fine tuning problems. So there, there's very much internal to science right now, this conflict, the, our co problem about, you know, the way that the evidence that it says that we could possibly have, and yet the model, the, the, the way that it depicts our, our epistemic situation in the universe. So I think that's, that's not, that, that is a, an ongoing internal problem for our theories as they are. And I, yeah, I think I would be inclined to say that, um, for example, what our theories tell us about totality as such, when totality as such is something that goes well beyond anything that any observer, any collection of observers 
could ever have information about that needs to be examined. I think that's problematic. Anybody from else from the panel wants to make a comment? Otherwise, I'll ask the audience if they have anything to say. Yeah, Evan, do you want to talk about autopoiesis a little bit? Because this circle on itself sounds a lot like it. <laughs> Am I putting you on the spot? J a little bit, but I mean, <laughs> the, aut the autopoiesis idea is, is an idea about circularity, but it's a little different. I mean, it's the idea that the organization of a living system has a kind of circularity to it, so that um, in specifying the minimal organization required for a, a bounded metabolic self-producing system, you have to specify it in such a way that you have a loop between the production of the boundary and the internal reaction network that is um, made possible by the boundary but also produces the boundary, and so you have this kind of like recursivity. So that's kind of a, a circle um, that did seem similar. Now we've had such a packed day, I'm trying to remember. There was a circle, oh, I think it was in Peter's talk, actually. It's very, yeah, it's very similar to ideas that, that Peter was talking about. And of course, all the neurons that are reparameterizing are autopoietic units that have to do it under the constraint of their, you know, metabolic viability. So, th so there's a real connection, real connection right. there. But it's a little di different from closing the circle in Janan's sense, which is right. a kind of right. explanatory circle that's getting closed. Yeah. Yeah. I just love to compare metaphors and, and <laughs> <laughs> circles are good. And see how they apply in different Actually while I have this like Dora Boros, right? <laughs> now that now that I've got the mic, I'm gonna ask a question. <laughs> <Oops>. <laughs> so it has to do with the perspectival realism, um, Michaela, and the way that you um, you were talking about it. Um, and, and this is really just a kind of clarification and to get a sense of the the landscape of argument. Because uh, y you said something like, you know, the basic commitment of the realist is to get things right. Mm -hmm. And I, I, under, I understand that, especially, say, if it's in an argument with a, you know, a relativist position or a, or a certain kind of strong constructionist position. But a constructive empiricist has a commitment to getting things right as well, but wouldn't describe it in the traditional realist language. So I, I wondered if you were wh where you were placing a, a constructive empiricist position is it sort of it's it is it a f is it uh i mean it's its commitment is to getting things right according to the idea of you know observational adequacy or 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 something like that rather than truth in the sense of how things are in themselves as an underlying structure separate from the mind or our models or something like that. So I take it you're arguing f the constructive empiricist isn't good enough for you. That's that's I guess the question, right? That's not uh, the constructive. So it, the constructive empiricist. Um, maybe there's only one Bas von Frozen, but I'm quite. <laughs> I find his work quite compelling. So he he basically argues that um, we should think about science as. Um, as building models and making predictions that are tested for their empirical adequacy, rather than being literally true stories about how nature is in itself. So he rejects one way of thinking about what the realist is committed to, but of course he's committed to the idea that we get it right, it's just he has a different understanding of that. So yeah, so my question is just where does he fall in your landscape? Thank you very much, no, it's a very, very important question. and. Uh, uh, I have a huge admiration for Bass. I mean, it's been one of the one of those I mean, towering figure in our field, and uh, really with a profound influence, I think, on uh, on me and many people in my generation. And part of the um, real inspiration for perspectival realism comes from some of his work. So his 2008 book on scientific representation, paradoxes of perspective, uh, is uh, one of the sources where this idea of perspective, well perspectivity or the perspectival nature of the representation is clearly spelled out and uh, uh, in uh, lots of details drawing from Arth and Dürer and, uh, and the history of measurement and Reichenbach. So for those of you that may not be familiar with the idea, Basman Prassen, uh, um, before the book that I was mentioning, uh, uh, wrote a book in 1980 called The Scientific Image um, that has been really uh, a game changer in the field of philosophy of science because in that book he put forward the view that it's supposed to be an alternative to scientific realism. 
So scientific realism has a very simple definition in philosophy of science. So if you are a scientific realist, you basically believe three main things. You believe that there is a mind-independent world, so that electrons, black holes, DNA exist and would have existed even if we had not existed. Um, you believe that uh, our best theories in mature science are approximately true, so they do the best at telling us the truth about those object. So truth is really important. And you also believe that the language of science has to be construed literally. So if I have a language that talks about electron, I take the term electron as referring, uh, picking out mind-independent objects in the world. So to be a scientific realist is usually understood as having this kind of threefold commitment to metaphysics, epistemology, and semantics. So with this 1980 book, Van Frassen put forward the rival view called the constructive empiricism. That basically is, um, to put it very uh, kind of crudely and roughly, is the view that says, um, I believe in mind independence, but I don't believe in uh, um, the importance of truth when it comes to the second uh, epistemological tenet. And I think there is a lot to be said about science that you can say without referring to truth. All you need is empirical adequacy. So all you want is a theory that is able to save the observable phenomena. Now, he made a very clear cut distinction there about, okay, what is an observable phenomena? So uh, Bass is a, is, a, is a strict empiricist in his view. So he believes that observable phenomena are observable to us as human beings with the body that we do have, with the eyes and the sensory system that we do have. So um, plants and animals are observables, but things like DNA strands are not observable because we need uh, a microscope to observe them, and even more so if we're talking about electrons or uh, black holes or... Um, I don't know what he would say about black holes. Maybe he would say that you can... So he has this argument where... Um, it says, well, if you can take a spaceship and get close enough, <laughs> you can still observe it with your eyes the moons of Jupiter. So technically speaking, it's observable. But uh, do what we may, there is no way for us to get close to an electron. So that counts as an observable. Um, so this is where I part my way from Van Frassen, okay? So his definition of phenomena as observable phenomena. Um, uh, I share a lot of his view about perspective in the perspectival nature of representation. Um, I like very much the idea that really mm -hmm. our ontological commitment should be focused on uh, an empirical basis. Uh, but I think where I would draw a line is on this observable observable distinction. I like to think of phenomena more along the lines of uh, um, Jim Woodward and Jim Bogan. So they, they they wrote this famous article in 1988 called uh, Setting the Phenomena, is that right? The Philosophical Review. And they said, well, what are the phenomena? The melting point of lead is a phenomenon, and the boiling point of water is a, is a, is a phenomenon. Weak neutral currents are phenomena. Some are observable, some aren't. Um, and they are the product of uh, inferences we make from data. So I, I would go for a more uh, robust notion of phenomena that I think actually shares a lot with the realist intuition about what there is. Um, so yeah, that, that's how I would locate realism in that debate. So actually, can I follow up? Sure, yeah. Because I think part of the spirit of Evan's question was what does me, what does getting it right mean? Even if you go for a more robust understanding of the phenomena, even with respect to that wider body of phenomena, is getting it right just producing models that, that recovers the phenomena? Or does it mean reproducing an account of the substructure of the phenomena that's literally true account of what there is in the world? Okay, uh, in that case, is, yeah. So the book I'm currently writing uh, tries to spell out some of those uh, thorny issues when it comes to how we think about the metaphysics of nature. and. I, um, okay, this is a kind of premature to say, as I don't want to take it as <laughs> kind of my last <laughs> words on this. But um, I'm inclined to say to get it right means to get the phenomena right and the data to phenomena journey right. And, um, and so I am less interested in uh, um, this discussion about, um, I guess, reductionism or the underlying invisible structure. So if you ask me uh, about, I don't know, the electric charge or the electron, um, there's a difference to be made between the phenomena that we are familiar with from, from science. So when you say that, I don't know, J.J. Thompson discovered the 
uh, 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 the electron, although he didn't call it electron, he called it a gold pass. So what, what did he do? Well, he had robust uh, data to phenomena journey that allowed him to measure with precision the um, charge to mass ratio of that object. Um, if we ask a different question, like, okay, what is an electron and what happens to the natural kind electron? I think this is where the story becomes more complicated because uh, I, as a perspectivalist, I have to take into account the fact that our images of those objects change and change dramatically over time. So I don't um, subscribe, for example, to views of natural kinds that are essentialist in nature, that believe that there are essences and that uh, those essences carve nature at its joints. And that's where I think I, I actually have a view that is uh, that shares a lot with the empiricist view and also with the inferentialist view, really, uh, of uh, um, I see people like Brandon, but also uh, Richard Healy in, uh, in, in philosophy of physics. So the idea that really natural kinds are inferential products that we make from from those phenomena. Hey, Chris, let me get you poke you a little bit. So, as a physicist, what would you say an electron is? <laughs> mm -hmm. What is an electron? Make your bet. Um, <laughs> That's the point. Well, I don't have an answer for that one. Right. <laughs> but, but, I d but I do have a bit of a response to Good. Michaela, if, okay. if, if you'll allow me. Um, I don't, I, I just, I've never thought about these subjects that either of you are talking about. But I noticed as I was listening that I had a, something of a visceral reaction to the notion of getting it right, mm -hmm. being the subject of science. <laughs> um, and maybe what I'm going to say fits within your framework, but maybe it doesn't, so I'll, I'll, I'll throw it out. It seems to me that science is a much richer thing than just attempting to get it right in the sense of reproducing something that's already been seen. Um, and the example that came to mind was the, the moment that Einstein called uh, the happiest moment of his life, when he uh, thought about the elevator experiment and said, well, if I were in an elevator, I wouldn't know whether the elevator was stationary on the Earth or whether it's being accelerated. I can't think of anything that would distinguish these two. Therefore, I'm going to postulate that the two are the same, the same phenomena. Um, and he wasn't trying to get anything right. I think he just had a flash of imagination. And um, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm winging it here. But I, I, I suspect he just had a flash of imagination. And it seemed like such a beautiful, simple thing that maybe something would flow from it. And it was only later that things did flow from that 1907 insight, I think it was 1907. Mm -hmm. um, and um, one of the disappointments in the theory was that uh, along the way to general relativity, he, um, he tried to use these ideas to calculate the, the, the precession of the perihelion of Mercury and he did not get the right value. And so there was a test then of whether this was a fruitful idea or not. But the test, the using it to get something right, was only something that was a posteriori to the experience of, of wow, this insight. So that, I think that's why I had a visceral reaction to the idea that science is about getting it, things right. I think it's, it, there's also a creative element to what many scientists are doing. They want to outstrip nature as, as it's already been, been seen. Can I and, and actually, I think that this uh, connects to my many discussions with Michelle. May I reply before you go to Michelle, or you want to go to Michelle first? Well, I wanted to attack you both. Okay. <laughs> can I just defend <laughs> myself, both and then you can once. attack Michelle? I mean <laughs> let, me, let me try to defend myself. Because <laughs> um, I know that, yeah, it kind of, uh, uh, as I said, I totally unwittingly, I tend to ruffle some feathers. <laughs> and actually, it was a choice of the E on Z. It wasn't even my choice. It was just a different title, but anyway. Um, <laughs> um, I clearly said in the talk that when I say getting it right, 
it's it's not a goal it's not the aim uh, of science okay so mm -hmm. don't think of science as aspiring to aiming at getting things right um the getting things right is a bit of a slogan if you like is a rhetoric tool uh, to have a narrative about how we think about science was what epistemic stance we we want to endorse about science um that we get it right, I think it's a fact. How we get it right, it's a the really interesting question. It's a question about scientific methodology. And there is plenty of scope for uh, precisely the role of creativity imagination within uh, perspective realist account or constructive empiricist account or other accounts. Because obviously we need to tell a story about how is it possible for human finite epistemic agents like us situated in a specific um, scientific perspective uh, to be able to reach out to nature and be able to produce reliable knowledge about nature. So creativity has an important role uh, because uh, naturally, even before creativity, laws of nature have an important role, right? Because you were talking about the, the principle of equivalence in, in Einstein theory. So sometimes we get it right by um, using laws of nature really as crutches in modeling uh, exercises that allows us to explore the space of what is possible. So if you look at some of those models in energy physics, laws uh, like parity or uh, um, other kinds of laws are used as uh, really crutches that we use to explore the boundaries of what is, what is even conceivable about those objects. In other cases, we go even beyond that uh, that's what Einstein did, that's what Galileo did with his experiment of the Tower of Pisa, where we have to figure out new laws of nature. Uh, Galileo challenged the Aristotelian view about free fall by thinking of a thought experiment that allowed him to come up with new laws, the laws about the free fall. But that's perfectly compatible with the overall uh, stance that we want to take about, about science. And I guess it's a stance that, um, you know, we can take different stances about science. I'm, I'm a pluralist, <laughs> so you want to be an instrumentalist, fine by me. You want to be a constructivist, absolutely fine by me. But I care about telling a story about how science works that delivers on some of those concerns that historians, sociologists have been raising all along uh, without necessarily landing me into some kind of uh, constructivism, relativism view. So it's possible to get it right, even if, yeah, there's plenty of scope for creativity and imagination. Yeah, I think maybe <coughs> Michele wasn't so much worried about the process, which is where things involve creativity, obviously, but in the end product, you know, and what is this model or theory going to tell me about the world, the data that I can capture? <coughs> and in that sense, you know, Einstein had this vision, which, by the way, all the principles in Einstein's stories, you know, about riding the beam of light or jumping, you know, <laughs> and feeling weightlessness, are all grounded in experience, mm. which is kind of an interesting thing, you know, and he goes from there to this sort of like almost metaphysical way of constructing a theory based on that initial impetus, which is all based on experience. But so I think she wasn't really, if I'm right, right, that it wasn't really about you know, there is no creative process. It, science is all about creative oh, yeah. processes, but really just the end result of how do you... How do you see science? Exactly. In this, in this exercise, <coughs> what yeah. kind of exercise? What, what do we do with this exercise? What is it about? Sorry, yeah. you go ahead, now it's Michelle's turn to be, <laughs> <laughs> to be the tag. Just, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I <laughs> generally just uh, I agree very much with, with what Marcelo has said, yeah, namely all these principles that were uh, adduced by Einstein as basic principles of physics arise not from experiments, from, but from direct experience. Yeah. Namely, he, uh, so to speak, he projected himself in a kinesthetic uh, uh, um, you know, thought experiment and he said, if I were in this situation in an elevator, what would I feel? And he, he found no difference between um, being in a, in a gravitational field with a free fall and, um, and, uh, and, and being accelerated. So he said, okay, that's, that's the same. That must be the same because my experience is not able to distinguish. So, okay, since 
Of course, I'm not sure because it's just an experience, but this experience was extremely compelling to him, much more compelling than any you know, historical set of, uh, or of body of experimental knowledge has been. And um, so uh, here I think it's very important to, to understand that the, the source of the creativity of Einstein was not just uh, an abstract uh, game. It was the feeling that by his creation of a new postulate, he was in deep agreement with his immediate first person experience of himself projected into a certain situation, uh, turned into um, a thought experiment. So uh, here, <coughs> <coughs> the source of the postulate is experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. The same with special relativity. It's all about yes. measuring time, measuring space. You know, it's all based on being Very close concrete. to burn train station. And, and atoms floating people on, on planets as well, you know, the same idea. Bob, just, so, just one side, you know, Bob had his hand up. Yeah. Oh, it only when, I, I just wanted to come back to perspectivalism. Oh, so let's, okay, then wait, then Adina, yes, yeah. please. Well, just a, a finger on this. I mean, I don't at all want to belittle what Einstein did or the yeah. really interesting point that he had this uh, sort of embodied way of having, of doing thought experiments, but for every Einstein, there's got to be <coughs> at least 10 Schmeinsteins <laughs> who think they have this great <laughs> idea and it doesn't work out, right? And that's what it means to get it right. It's that not only do you yeah. have the great yeah. idea, yeah. Right. but you have a way of testing that idea against some kind of metric to see whether it pans out. And, and you know, the other people, we don't know who they're, what their names are. No, no, Einstein. No, no, they write me every no, week. No. Well, I, I, I know. They <laughs> Einstein made books. a lot of mistakes, too. <laughs> that's, that's totally fine. Yeah, so <laughs> Einstein was a Schmeinstein, you know. I'll, I'll show you my list. <laughs> you know, there's this famous um, recommendation that Poincaré wrote for Einstein when he was being, you know, sort of when he was applying for some job where he says, um, his mind searches down all avenues. And because of that, many of them are bound to lead to dead ends. Right, exactly. Uh, may I ask a question to Robert? I have a burning question, please. Sure, yeah. Because, uh, yes. Because, uh, Robert, you said that as soon as you posit experience as the, the you know, what is referred to by a certain word, you have missed it. And therefore, every attempt to do that, to, to extract experience from its background status and posit it as a term, is a failure by, by principle, in principle. It's bad metaphysics, so to speak, by, by, by bad idealistic metaphysics. Yet, <coughs> if you don't do so, Namely, if you, if you th wipe out the field of language so that you eliminate all the terms that refer to subjects, uh, uh, situation, experience, consciousness, and so on, if you do that, you leave the, um, the field free for uh, you know, standard realism, which is uh, precisely what generates the famous blind spot that itself generates all, all sorts of foundational paradoxes. And that also, you know, leave us into a world in which we don't even recognize ourselves. So to me, it seems that um, true, any discourse about experience, even if any discourse of the, about the primacy of experience, is bound to have a flow in it. As a metaphysical position, it doesn't uh, fit the bill. Yet, it has a therapeutical um, effect. And as such, it should be used as uh, a tool in order to uh, reveal something to, to standard um, people, to scientists and so on, to reveal them that there is something mi missing in their picture. As soon as they have done that, as Wittgenstein would say, 
they can, uh, you know, take the ladder and throw it. But the ladder should never be forgotten, because if not, um, you, you, you just uh, stay into na naivete. That, that's my uh, point to your, my reaction to your... Uh, no, uh, I'm, uh, I'm ex very sympathetic to what you're trying to do. But my analysis of what you're trying to do is you're trying to get people to see something. Yeah. <coughs> and the point that, and it's interesting because I, you know, I'm also a fan of Douglas Harding and, uh, you know, we, we, we end up using many of the same images and so on. Um, the, the, so I, I, I'm sympathetic with, you know, you've got to see this and I'm also sympathetic with you reading that Husserl was in a, way, trying to do the same thing. It, it, it's a kind of conversion experience. I don't think that changes the fact that the moment your mouth is open about it, the moment you turn it into a something that you're trying to see, you sound, it suddenly, you sound like a religious fundamentalist. And I think the movement toward, again, I'm sympathetic <coughs> toward it, but the movement toward, you know, the Upanishads <coughs> and so on, does make it sound like you're saying, I now have a ground here. I now have a ground on which to stand, and experience gives me some kind of positionality or toehold. And I think the moment I say that, you will say, no, but of course not. So there's a loop here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that loop that, you know, we, we have different products. I'm trying to draw attention to the loop. Mm, yes, yes. Um, one place, can I, can I segue into perspectivalism on this? Sure. Um, the, the thing <coughs> that makes me, uh, that worries me about perspectivalism is, you know, because there is a sense in which it's, it's a way of framing it that can elicit a lot of consent, including from people who have coming from different positions, and it may be because it's hiding something, because there's two, and that again, this may be just reflecting my own ignorance, but there seems to be two very different reads on it, and I think that what people want is some kind of synthesis of the two reads. But one read is, is there are only perspectives. And if you really want to push pragmatism in, into a kind of Richard Rorty kind of pragmatism, then there is no elephant. There's just a sword and a, and a, and a trunk and a rope. And they all work perfectly fine. They, they have their own kind of pragmatic context. And that's all there is. Right? And, and that's a kind of very... All these positions are laid out in the Buddhist world, which is why you know, I'm tending to go there. But that's a, a kind of deflationary madhyamika where the absolute truth, what the world is really like, is that there are only conventional truths. That's one position. The other one is, no, I mean, <laughs> there's gotta be an elephant out there somewhere because what we find is we have to be ma able to make a distinction between what the Buddhists would call conventional truths and conventional falsehoods. And the only way that that, and we in fact do that, and we do it successfully, and that, that is an indication that our conventional truths are somehow approaching or constrained by, in some way, some absolute truth. So you have there, there you have a realist and an anti-realist, diametrically opposed readings, which both can be understood as um, perspectivalisms of sort. So what I worry about is the reason the position seems so congenial is it allows you to go ahead and do the work that you're doing but kind of defer this kind of deep metaphysical puzzle that's underneath and, you know, and providing some ground or no ground or what. Do you want to reply, Michelle, or shall I reply to mm -hmm. my bit? Okay. <laughs> Um, no, thank you, that's really interesting. Well, the tension is there, and it's a tension that in a way uh, puzzles and intrigues me and anyone else who's interested in perspectivism. Um, and maybe, maybe you're right that um, the tension is probably bound, uh, bound to stay there, so it's a way of uh, uh, reaching a compromise where uh, we are trying to make sense of some epistemic aspect, uh, um, but when it comes to the, the the kind of the big question about the elephant or the market. <laughs> one can go one way or the other. One can go Rortian or I can go realist on the other end. Um, I was intrigued by what Chris said last, uh, last night. He said, uh, someone accused me of being a pragmatist and the more I read about it, the more I think I, I'm a pragmatist, mm -hmm. okay. 
I mean, let me give you the reverse of that, why I cannot bring myself to be a pragmatist. <laughs> you you <laughs> can't bring yourself to be no, a pragmatist. No, no. In, in, the, the in, in, in a sort of Rortian sense, just because oh, 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 oh. Rorty was mentioned. <laughs> um, although, again, obviously, there's a lot of uh, continuity of themes here and concerns with a, a kind of a Rortian uh, uh, view. Um, well, there is this lovely uh, exchange between Rorty and Patnam uh, uh, that was published uh, about 20 years ago on Journal of Philosophy. I think it's called the, uh, what was it called? The Manus of Relativism, something like that. I can't remember the exact title. Where there's uh, this interesting exchange between Patnam, who at the time was going through his uh, um, kind of Kantian uh, pragmatist internal realism, and Rorty uh, in the end accuses him of uh, it's like, you are exactly like me, because what is your uh, warranted assertability if not what's assertable and warranted for us as, uh, um, as you call it, uh, wet liberal, <laughs> that we're always willing to hear the other side, they're willing to engage in uh, dialogues, but it's ultimately consensus, it's ultimately social agreement, there is nothing over and above that, and Putnam trying to resist that kind of <laughs> objection from Rorty. Um, so the tension is there. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a tension that's been internal to the history of perspectivism all along, in a way. Uh, and you can read it both ways, but um, that, that's where the getting things right, I think, matters to me, because for a long time I've been uh, toying with this idea uh, um, of uh, coherence or warranted assertability. What is it truth if not that at the end of the day, right? We don't want to sound... Uh, um, dogmatic, and I mean, the word truth, I mean, brings with it all sorts of really terrible stereotypes about, you know, intracultural battles and petty doctrinarism, all sorts of stuff that we don't want to be associated with. Um, but at the same time, I it comes down to that debate, right? What, what, I what is truth in the end? Is it just what's, what's uh, warranted for, for a given society at a given time? And then how do you tell the difference? What what counts as your society? What is there an ideal society? Is there any society? What, what happens if you are in a society that is a totalitarian society? What will count as truth if we take truth to the really radical extreme of just consensus about a community of epistemic inquirers, right? Um, and, and I think that's why I started my talk the way I did. That I mean, those sorts of concerns are concerns that I have with me, and I think are concerns that kind of motivate the kind of stance I, I want to take on the issue. Did I have a question from the audience there? <coughs> uh, it wasn't you, actually. It was this gentleman, but it can be you, too. Let's just start with him. I just saw him first. Thank you. Oh, you yeah, definitely. We'll go up there. My name is Albert Levis, and I'm a psychiatrist. And uh, I came to learn from you, from Manchester, Vermont. And uh, I thank you very much for pondering on these very serious issues about how we can make sense of psychology, religion, how to understand uh, the very difficult issues, the crossing the last frontier of science, which is making sense of psychology and morality. And <coughs> I'd like to share some of my uh, story and contributions, but what I would like to say is that in order to create a science, we have to find, you know, outgrowing subjectivity by being objective and finding and agreeing what is the object of science. What is it, the object that we're observing to make <coughs> psychology, morality into a science? And that should be independent of the observer. A science like Galileo, you know, contributed the scientific discovery, was looking at the periodicity up in the sky. And we can observe in psychology periodicity at certain level, which can make it easier for us to make behavior into a science. And seeing the difference between the human science and the inert science. And seeing what is the difference between how the mind works versus the machine. And how we can make behavior into a real science by observing the differences, by observing 
the way that the mind works by finding a phenomenon of periodicity in human discourse. Okay. And the... <laughs> oh, is that the question? Uh, I'm sorry? Is that the question is, my, can that be done? My study uh, from modern study was this called Which conflict yeah. analysis, the formal theory of behavior coming to vali be validated <laughs> into the moral science has been looking at periodicity of a phenomenon of the Greek creation stories where you have a phenomenon repeated across five generations of Greek gods, but then it's with the creation of a religion, creating a phenomenon of transformation. And so, you know, my position is that behavior can become a science, and a science, <laughs> observing it on a play or on a anything, all creativity, a book, a movie, is a science that observes the phenomenon of transformation of a conflict to a resolution as a scientific, energetic, mechanical phenomenon that is totally independent of our <coughs> subjectivity. And this is the phenomenon that we can also observe in the creativity of a patient or a student when we're challenged to convey what is psychology as a science of conflict resolution and what is religion as discoveries of science of resolving conflict and how religions have evolved as scientific discoveries in the course of history becoming more uh, effective in resolving the problems of the family institution and how they have not finished the job and how the world is awaiting for science to help religions to understand what they discovered and complete their job. <laughs> okay. So, uh, okay, good. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody wants to comment on this? Um, <coughs> okay, so thanks for your comments, sir. And did you have a comment? Let's make sure the comments are brief so that other people have a chance to speak. Uh, I was going to speak uh, after Michaela was just speaking. I wanted to, uh, um, Merleau-Ponty had a statement, it's very simple, ego, other, truth. Each needs the others. Uh, uh, Michaela was talking about uh, doctrinal, situational norms and so on, but I only heard other minds once in uh, the discussion. Uh, um, we, uh, the other has a part in this, doesn't it? Was Merleau Pontry, P Ponty correct? The second person rather than just the first and the third person. Yes. He's the expert on Merleau Ponty. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle should answer that yes. question. Uh, well, I don't know. You, you, you have so something to say uh, uh, even about um, Merleau-Ponty's uh, theory of other minds? Whatever. Uh, just, uh, just a short comment. Uh, you know, the idea of uh, the problem of other minds is a, a, a typical of uh, contemporary philosophy of mind, but it has never occurred this way to phenomenologists. For instance, uh, for Sartre, uh, the other is not a problem. It's already there when, when I am, because when I am, I have also, you know, all these, um, these looks that define myself, that, that constitute my being, as uh, Jean-Paul Sartre would say. For instance, when I am ashamed, what does it mean being ashamed? That means that from the very start of what I um, I uh, experience in the world, I know that I am under the gaze of someone el else. And so uh, the, the, the other minds is not, is not a problem. It's, it's not a sort of uh, difficult problem of how do I uh, extract the belief into someone else when I am myself. Because myself is already made of this, um, this the, the, the presupposition that someone is looking at me. So the last statement there was on truth, the ego, other, truth. Yes. Each needs the other. Yes, that's right. But e even in Kant, you find this idea, which uh, I find it quite extraordinary. So there are passages of the uh, canon of the pure reason in the, um, at the end of the critique of pure reason, where Kant says, how do we define truth? We define truth as the agreement with the object. But he also says, some for something to be true, it has to be communicated with others and found it to be valid for the reason of every human being. He has this idea that um, 
that yeah you need others and uh, and communicated that's right yes it has to be communicated it has to be able we have to be able to communicate and find it to be valid for the reason of every human being uh, to be true did you have something other yeah uh, yeah i guess one thing i wanted to pull out um well there's two things but but well we'll start with the first one if we have uh, time it's fine um but the idea of limits right i mean because uh in a number of ways we've talked about the idea that horizons, right, the, the, the importance of horizons, the idea of vanishing points, um, and I just w wanted to ask you guys sort of about that, because, you know, there's, there's a narrative about science that it's ever increasing and ever expanding, and it's all great, and that's, you know, part of the triumphalist vision of science, but I think one of the things that comes out of some of the things we've talked about is that there, you know, s there are places that we shouldn't expect science to go, that are not part of science's job, right? That there's a number of different ways that human beings uh, experience, encounter, produce truth, and science is good for some of them. And I think part of the perspec perspectival realism uh, discussion is that, and what I really liked is the idea that like, well, where, where getting it right matters is in the workshop. You know, science happens in the workshop, not out in the life world. It come parts of it come back out to the life world. But where you can get where you're concerned about getting it right is in the workshop. So in some sense, even there's a limit. But I wanted to ask you guys uh, about this idea of you know, we we br we we blanch at the idea of limits. Science shouldn't have limits. But horizons, I think, is a different idea. And I'm just wondering, you know, how uh, how can how how can limits or horizons in the context where we talk about been be actually be a positive thing? You know, when Marcel and I were talking this morning, I thought Marcel had a great idea about talking about um, you know ways of making progress by talking about what you can't do rather than what you can do. So you know, in the context of say quantum quantum interpretations, how do quantum interpretations or the debate about them show us where we can't go and therefore where we can go? Um, so I don't know. I just throwing that out there. Yeah, well, you could. Um, you scared one of the panelists away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, she reached she reached her limit of childcare. <laughs> so perfectly oh, understandable. Yeah. You can you can make a list, right, of 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 those limits that that we know that we just can't go there. Um, and uh, and I'm very fond of those limits. You know, um, you you mentioned Gödel. Somebody mentioned Gödel, and you know the, the idea of truth in mathematics or completeness in mathematics. That's one. Um, in cosmology, there are quite a few of them that I love. You know, so for example, you cannot say anything concretely about what's beyond our observable horizon, our cosmic horizon, because we cannot gather information from there unless you violate the speed of light. So even though we infer that there is a universe out there, just because there should be, since our point in space is not special, there is nothing you can say for sure about what's out there. So that's a complete, very well-known limit. And there is another one. So let's go back to Earth. I've worked, and many people have worked on origins of life. And, you know, and I can state the following. Unless you can prove a theorem, that can tell you that no life can only go to life according to very few biochemical pathways. So there are just a few ways in which you can make the magic happen, so to speak. Even if you reproduce life from no life in the laboratory, you cannot know what happened here on Earth, you know, 3.5, 2.8 billion years ago. So that's a question. How did life originate on Earth? We don't know, unless you can prove that there are very limited pathways. And so these are very you know, objective scientific questions, not even going to consciousness and computational issues like Turing and stuff, um, that you just know there are fundamental limits, you know, that you, you just, there I call them the unknowables, you know. And I, I'm very happy embracing them. I think they're just part of the scientific discourse, you know. Just one second, because she has to bring you the microphone because we are videotaping that. <coughs> Thinking about yeah. Wigner and his comment uh, that uh, how mathematics is uh, especially useful for uh, describing the world, and um, it's kind of like a, a, a miracle somehow or other, uh, something unusual about it. Um, I'm thinking of blind spot, perhaps, is maybe those aspects of the world or whatever, that are not describable by mathematics. And uh, anybody want to comment on that in terms of a 
limitation of our blindness based on our reliance on mathematics to uh, use that as a tool to describe reality. I think that's probably true in the physical sciences, you know, but there may be other blind spots, you know. Um, for example, I just mentioned the origin of life. Um, you can say that, you know, we cannot use, well, biochemistry is somewhat mathematical, but you can't use uh, what we know of biochemistry to explain how life originated on Earth. Um, and because you just can be present in the past in order to know exactly what happened there, right? So you cannot gather information about how the muddle pond created the first protocell, you know, that kind of became something that could reproduce. Um, so that's an example, and I think there are others related to the environment as well, that, you know, our relationship with the planet. So I'm not quite sure. I, I agree with you that that is true within the physical sciences, issues of boundary conditions related to the first cause problem, which completely takes cosmology you know, to the ground, right? That's where we should, if you're an honest cosmology, cosmologist, that's where you throw the towel, you know, is the first cause problem. Uh, and that's a mathematical issue. Well, more than that, but it's also a mathematical issue. Um, but I, I would imagine there are other examples, maybe consciousness is another one that is not necessarily mathematical, unless you believe the, sci the, the brain is a computational machine, which some people here already disagreed with. Um, yeah, not the case, but I think you're correct in that uh, in the physical sciences, the two are related. Ye we have one less because we're blowing up our time again. There will be no students coming in here, I hope, but we have to go home. So let's see, Jacques has the last question there. Well, thanks. I'm honored <laughs> to have the last question. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully not the last word as well. So this is mainly for for Michaela about um, something that I think has been acknowledged but kind of not answered fully, which is uh, to do with getting it right. Whatever getting it right means for the scientific community um, must have something to do with the resistance of the material world that we deal with to our efforts. Uh, there must be some input from the world itself. And this represents also a, another form of limitation that we face, is that we're also limited by the world that doesn't always do what we want it to do. And connected to that is something that troubles me about the usage of the word perspectival, is that it suggests a passive object I'm not saying this is what you intended, but it does give the idea that we're looking at something just from different angles. But I think it would be more true to say that the world responds to how we look at it. Uh, so I'm just wondering if I could get some more direct commentary about that. Sure, thank you. No, it's a good point. Uh, it is a good point because the very metaphor of the perspective invites the uh, much dreaded view of the uh, knower as a spectator of being passive uh, with respect to the world. And it's, it's not at all what I want to suggest. We are active epistemic agents that engage with the world around us, both in harvesting data in very complex fields like uh, take cosmology, as mentioned in the Dark Energy Survey, it's extraordinarily active <laughs> and proactive uh, amount of work that cosmologists are doing to probe the universe to try to find the answer to those questions using different kinds of data, uh, comparing those data, assigning you know, priors that allow them to make inferences about what dark energy might be. Uh, I like to think of the metaphor of the perspective, uh, um, and this is really comes from uh, the Renaissance art, right? You think of it. Why, why perspective was so important in the Renaissance art? Um, think of Piero della Francesca, think of uh, um, Van Hyck uh, or other examples. Because the perspective, and really this is a Neocantian historian of art, Erwin Panofsky, that says this in a beautiful book about perspective as a symbolic form. Perspective creates the illusion of a space 
that extends well beyond the represented canvas. You have a vanishing point from which the lines are shot out and that vanishing point um, revolutionizes medieval art because you don't have any more an aggregate of figures that pile up on the borders of the canvas. You have a, a frame, a window on reality and you're invited to look through that window as if you were looking to a space from nowhere. But there is no space from nowhere. It's a, it's a perspectival illusion created by the uh, skillful use of the perspective. So that, that's what I like about perspective, not because it invites any idea of uh, the epistemic agent as a spectator, but because in a way it delivers on this realist view that we're getting it right. We are looking through a window, knowing all too well that um, we should give up on this presumption that there is um, a one unique, uh, true objective reality behind, uh, behind that. So that's a metaphor of the Kant that I was mentioning in response to Bill Paul, uh, this idea that uh, yeah, there is a focal point, there is a vanishing point that, uh, that we need for our experience of the world. It actually brings human experience into art, right? It takes art from being a view of God, uniform, you know, completely devoid of any perspective, to something that now the observer is part of what's being obs observed in a sense that this world is mine not just gods. So it's a humanization of perspective in a sense, which I think is really what you're trying to do too. <laughs> Anyways, good. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Uh, I really appreciate it. <coughs> thanks to all our speakers for their patience. And Many thanks to Marcelo <laughs> and Amy for organizing the event. Yeah.